Okay, so last time we, we proved uh, the elder inequality, you remember? Okay. So basically it tells you that if you start by two, um, two function, one of which is in LPOV, the other one G, take it in LQ, V with where P and Q are conjugate exponent, which means that then here we have that the product of the two function belongs to L1 and uh, and especially you can bound this L1 norm in terms of the product of the LP norm of F and the LQ norm of G. Okay. Okay, beside this, we prove the Minkowski inequality. We somehow we observe that it provides a tool to prove the triangular inequality for the LP norm. Okay, so you have okay. So we go on with our analysis. Um, okay, so just uh, oh, this, the following theorem, which is known under the name of Chebyshev inequality. Okay, so you start by p less than infinity and take f a function which belongs to a p. And we define mt as the measure of uh, the point where the modulus of f is larger than t. Um, okay, so we have that bound this mt in this way. Okay, of course this is a consequence of another version of the Chebyshev inequality that we already proved, okay? So it is the fall of that, that by the former version, by the somehow former version of the Chebyshev quality. So we, ap we apply our former version to the modulus of f rise to the power p and to t instead of t, t to the power p, okay? So we have
the measure of this of this uh, set is less or equal than one over t to the power p to the times the integral of e of f p, and this is precisely 1 over t to the power p times the LP norm of f to the power p. So basically what we get is that the measure okay, is, is what we want, okay? t being this two quantity the same this is uh, sorry less or equal Okay, so um, an immediate consequence of this uh, of this uh, Chebyshev inequality is that somehow that, that the convergence in the LP norm is stronger than the convergence in LP, and so the proposition is the following. And moreover. If you have that a uh, sequence uh, fn converts to a function f in LP, then you can extract uh, a, sus a subsequence of the original sequence which, which converge pointwise uh, everywhere, almost everywhere, to the function f. So Consider a sequence of function fn in LP such that we have that goes to zero, okay? As n tends to plus infinity. This is the convergence. This is what I mean when I say. Uh, this means that Fn converts to F in Lp. No. Okay. Okay, then what we want to prove is that Fn converts to F in measure. So we want to, to use this, okay? So it's clear, no? How you use this, you fix an epsilon. <coughs> Of course, instead of f, you, you consider the difference between fn and f. Okay, so you have that for any epsilon positive. Uh, we have that the measure of uh, um, of the set where fn minus f is larger or equal than epsilon is less or equal than. Uh, 1 over epsilon to the power p times uh, fn minus f p to the power p. Okay, so this goes to 0 as n tends to plus infinity, so you can make this measure arbitrarily small. So and another corollary uh, 
corollary of, of this proposition somehow is that if you have that if you have a sequence fn which converts to f in lp then there exists uh, a subsequence actually you can claim this just for a subsequence such that subsequence uh, call it uh, f and k for instance such that f and k converge to the same f almost everywhere okay so and this is uh, this is a corollary of this proposition in the sense that this proposition tells you that the convergence in lp is stronger than the convergence in measure and we know that if a sequence converts to a function f in measure, then we can extract uh, a subsequence which converts almost everywhere, okay? Measure, this is for previous proposition and from this we deduce that there exists so we prove this no there exists a subsequence such that f n of k goes to f almost f okay Okay, so what we proved last time, we proved a lot of things about uh, the, um, the norm in LP. We, we finally proved that it is indeed in R. What is, it remains to prove is that this, the space LPE is complete, okay? Because, of course, for application, only complete spaces are interesting, okay? So the theorem, which is known under the name of uh, Ritz Fischer, sure that indeed LP is a complete space. So So we, uh, we distinguish two cases. Um, the cases in which P is in between 1 and infinity, but doesn't take the, the values infinity. And then we will consider the case when P is equal to infinity. OK, so we want to, to prove that the space is complete. So we start by a Cauchy sequence in P. OK, so let then be uh, sequence okay in p and then by this previous proposition Okay, we have that, what we somehow we already observe, we have that we can estimate the measure of, uh, of this set where in this way, where epsilon of course is uh, an arbitrary small number. I'm um, sorry, uh, now we, since we are starting by a Cauchy sequence, we let me okay. Uh, OK. 
okay and this goes to zero as and, and then goes to plus infinity so in particular we have that the sequence fn is a Cauchy sequence measure Then, for what we already proved, we proved that uh, there exists a measurable function f and a subsequence uh, um, so and a subsequence, I think. F and K, call it sub C, C, C sequence. Okay, such that we have that F and K goes to F almost everywhere. Okay. Okay, and of course uh, it, it, it's clear that F would be the, the candidate for the convergence movement. Now, we use the fact that our fn is a sequence in LP. OK, so since it's a, it's a Cauchy sequence. In LP, we have that for any epsilon positive, there exists an integer n, so that for any index n and m larger than uh, n, we have that fn minus fn p is less than epsilon. OK, we can take it to the power p. OK, now. If you remember, uh, when we uh, when we construct in uh, the theorem where we prove that uh, um, a, a sequence, uh, a Cauchy sequence in measure admits uh, um, a subsequence which converts pointwise uh, almost everywhere to a function f, we notice that n k is increasing with respect to k. I mean, we prove that with the no with no loss of generality, we can assume that this index and k is uh, is increasing with respect to k so we, we, we still need this uh, and so we have have that if k, we have that we can assume that nk is larger than k, and if k is larger than n, and n is larger than n, then nk is larger than capital N, and then we have Okay, that we estimate the, the norm, LP norm of this, uh, okay, which is, uh, okay, write it as a norm, is less than, than epsilon. And this is for any 
and, and k larger than n. Okay, then we also use, um, so we, we want somehow uh, to combine uh, the convergence in p with the convergence, uh, with the pointwise convergence. So on the other hand, we also know that We have that Fn minus Fnk, this modulus to the power p, converse. Now I take n fix minus f. This functions almost everywhere in E as k tends to plus infinity. And then here, so we use the Fatou lemma. So so we have that limit Fn minus N F so the limit is less or equal than the limit this case tends to uh, plus infinity of uh, Fn minus Nk to the power p. And this is less or equal than epsilon. So what we prove is that Fn minus f is uh, tends to zero as n tends to plus infinity. So what remains to prove is that the limit f um, also belongs to, to Lp, okay? Okay, so we want to estimate the LP norm of F. Okay, we use uh, uh, the triangle inequality. So this is less or equal than epsilon for an suffici sufficiently large, and we have this sequence uh, um, is a Cauchy sequence, so it's uh, it's uh, it's uniformly bounded by 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 some hand, okay. And so this is this is finite. Okay, this is for any n larger than some. Okay, now we it remains to prove the case when p is equal to plus infinity. Okay, so we fix uh, two index n and then two positive integer, integer. and we we have that we recall how it is defined. Um, the L infinity norm is the essential supremum over E of uh, Fn minus Fn. Okay. So by definition of essential supremo, we 
we have with there is this uh, a set which depends on those two integers says so that the set has zero measure and uh, L infinity norm can be viewed as the norm of the supremum, so um, the classical norm of E minus this set of, of measure zero. Okay, so the idea is that we want to remove this set of measure zero over all the possible integer n and m. We are doing anyway countable operation. Okay, so you define A as the union over N and M of E and M. Okay, so since we are doing countable operation, we have that the measure of A is A0. And okay, so we define uh, B as the set E, so our the domain, minus indeed this set of measure zero. So we have that Fn is, uh, so now we focus just on this set B. So our original sequence of Fn is a Cauchy sequence. Uh, in the sense of the of the uniform convergence, okay, uh, the Cauchy sequence uh, uh, in the sense, in the classical sense of the uniform of the uniform convergence, B and then we have that that supremum of fn minus fn b goes to zero for n and then that goes to zero. So hence we have that the limit exists. uniform limit and uh, so we can extend f outside of b so in a for instance you can put it equal to zero so yeah here yes So when p is equal to plus infinity, we define the LP norm in that way. Okay, this is this is just a definition. So if you remember the essential, the essential supremum, if you look at the definition, is is uh, yes, it's the infimum, and uh, it, it's defined up to a set of measure zero, which are this one. Okay, so this would depends on the index. So we have that this set here. I mean, this definition. It's just uh, the, the usual, the classical definition of supremum outside set of measure zero. This set here, A, E, N, N. Okay? We have just to look at the definition of essential supremum. Okay? And then the idea is that uh, we want to use what we already know about the classical uniform convergence. So we remove this set of... Uh, of measure zero, we we work with outside this set. We found that f exists, and then we say, okay, we can extend f in A 
for instance, putting a equal to zero is not important because a is a set of measure zero, okay? So you can, you can define it as you wish somehow. So. to zero and in this way we have that it converts to to f I think that's the thing. And of course, uh, the, the, the limit that belongs to an infinity because it's, uh, it's uh, okay. Now we introduce so somehow within this due space, at this space, we can define um, bounded linear functional. So we consider P in this set and P of E, and we want to define the, the, du the dual space of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, of this Banach space. Okay. So we will uh, we, okay. We will denote with L P. Uh, we put a prime. This is uh, the dual space of of an P. So how it is defined? So this is a, a space of function. Mm. So we have a G, a functional G, between uh, with takes values in P. So no takes value. I mean uh, the, the the element R in P and takes values in R. Okay, G is linear and continuous. Okay, this is a vector space. you have that if you take a linear combination of uh, gf1 plus uh, this is okay this is trivial this is alpha gf1 a linear function and and they are they are bounded So somehow our final ha aim would be to to, to characterize this uh, this functional uh, G, okay? And of course we will proceed by step. Okay, so 
we need to prove this proposition. So you consider p between 1 and infinity. And we, we have that if we consider the, the conjugate q of p, we have that each function each function g, which belongs to q of v, define a bounded Yes, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, bounded linear uh, functional. Take the product of the two, okay? And moreover, you can also say something about um, the norm of this big F, which is precisely equal to the norm of G, the LQ norm of G. The fact that uh, f is linear is clear because the integral is linear, okay? So the function f is clearly linear. Okay, since the integral is linear. Okay, we prove um, the fact that it is bound, that it somehow it is easily followed by, by the elder inequality, okay? So we have, uh, so by definition of, um, so the norm of f as functional is equal to, okay, it's less or equal than um, than the norm of GQ. Okay, this is the supremum of uh, this quotient, so, uh, so we are done. So what remains to prove is that is this uh, equality, okay? Okay, so just to put, put yeah, that.
Bene, destra ci supprimo, nuova F in P. F different from 0. Ok. Ok, so we want to prove that the norm of F is equal to the LQ norm of G. Uh, so somehow it's better to divide the proof in three cases. Okay, so we consider three cases. Okay, the first one is when P is strictly in between 1 and infinity. Uh, so, so we want to prove this. So we have to select somehow in a, in a proper way a function f which realizes the maximum and to prove that the maximum coincides with which realizes the supreme. Okay. So we have, uh, we want to select a function f in a p, which realized the supremum. Okay, um, p and q are conjugate exponent. Yeah, from time to time I forget to Usually we always use this notation P and Q for conjugate exponent, okay? <coughs> okay, so a way to define this way is the following. So you define uh, F has uh, the modulus of G raised to the power Q over P times the sine of G. The sine function. It, it depends on the point. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah it's the sine function. Uh, sine. Okay, this is of. I mean, it's f of x, g of x, <coughs> sine of. Earth. Okay, so where g is positive is uh, uh, is one, where it's negative is minus one sine. Okay, so we have that f to the power p by definition is g q is equal to um, uh, okay, let me this is call it uh, star. This is okay to see this. Okay. This is uh, sorry, are just computation, but finance Q over P times the sine of uh, sine of G. So this is F times G. This is uh, the modulus of G. And so, since these two are conjugate exponents, so you have that Q over P is equal to Q minus 1 and 
so you have that this is QP and sorry Q minus one. This is P Q. Here, the ah, the normal path is functional. Yeah. I mean, this is um, um, this is I mean the this, the definition of a normal path functional. Okay, so you 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 compute uh, for any f in uh, in the domain in the LP space in this case, you compute f in uh, you take the supremum. Take the supremum. Okay, this is a general definition, doesn't, uh, not a... Yes, because, um, so f is a functional from LP to, to R, right? So f g I is fixed. You fix g in LQ. And you define you define so G is in LQ. And this is a way to define the functional, okay? But the functional um, takes values in, in function in LP, where P is the conjugate exponent of LQ, okay? So they have this uh, and um, okay from this so okay since we know that our special choice of f leads to this we have that uh, and we know that um, since g is in q by by hypothesis then from this we have that f is in p because we still did not check okay now we know this uh, and so it's uh, we can we can uh, uh, we can test our functional capital f on, on this small f okay and see what happens uh, so okay so we have <coughs> by definition this is f times g and we use this and this is G uh, Q, and uh, so we are done, right? Because um, times
so we have that the supreme is achieved in this choice of for this choice of f and actually the norm of f is equal to the iq norm of g Consider the case when when the p is equal to infinity and uh, for instance q is equal to one. And then conjugate exponent. So in this case we have that our functional f goes from an infinity v with values in R. And okay, it's defined as we know. So we have that this time we take f as uh, precisely this just the sign of g uh, okay of course f is in an infinity because it takes uh, finite values and we have that is equal to this so we are done okay so the last case is when p is equal to 1 and q is equal to, uh, to infinity from L1 of E with values in R. So we want to prove, I just want to um, remind you. That the supremum for the F uh, in L1, which are not zero element of uh, of this quotient uh, one is equal to the L infinity norm of uh, of G. Okay, so if G is uh, okay we start by observing the trivial case when G is equal to zero of course there's nothing to prove okay Consider a case when g is not identically zero. Uh, so it's, it's different from zero on a set of positive measure. Then we claim the following, and we and we prove the following. But first, we, we state the following claim. Uh, we have that for any integer k positive, such that uh, the L infinity norm of G is larger than k, then there exists a function f in L one. V such that this function f in L1 is equal to 1 and uh, 
such that this integral is also equal to k. So in that way, so in that way we will have that that it means. over k of this function f, which of course belongs and um, depends on k, g is larger than infinity. OK, so hmm? fk times g. Functional, right? Okay, so we, we focus on this set EK defined in this way is the set of the X in E such that um, G is larger than K. Okay, so by definition of essential supremum, we have that since we have that the norm, the L infinity norm of G is larger than K, um, this set EK. As, uh, as positive uh, as positive measure. Okay, then we distinguish um, somehow within this part of the proof two further cases. In the case when, um, so we know that EK is a um, positive measure, so we assume that beyond being positive is, is finite. Okay, if the other case will be treated um, using this one. Okay, then we can reset function f that we want to construct in this way. Take one and divide by E k, the measure of e k, this makes sense, times the characteristic function of e k times, uh, one more time, the sine of uh, the sine function of, of g. Okay, now we compute the functional for this choice of f. So we just substitute and what we get is the following. We have a g because the sine of g times g is the modulus of g times k e k. And um, okay, this is I'm actually doing the integral over e k, so this is larger than. This is precisely equal to k, OK? And so we are done. And now, the case when, OK, moreover, we also have that the L1 norm of f is equal to 1.
Okay. And the other case, when well, the measure of EK is uh, is um, plus infinity, can be treated uh, somehow analogously to this. We just observe that if this is infinity. Okay, then we can find uh, a measurable set uh, Fk, call it Fk, such that you have that Fk is contained in uh, in Ek. It has a finite measure, but find the measure but positive measure. Uh, because for instance you can observe that in general you can split this is the thing that we already saw that okay you can uh, you can see this as the union of uh, n of ek intersected uh, minus n n okay is a finite measure and so on. And then, uh, once we do this, we, we define the function f uh, using this um, set of k, and we proceed as before, OK? And deal as before. Okay, so this concludes this proof. We see another lemma, which will be helpful to um, to characterize this uh, this functional. Okay, now we consider the integer, the, the exponent p between 1, but doesn't take the values plus infinity. So let g be an integrable function. Over, over e, and we want e to have finite measure, and we assume that there exists a constant m. Positive. Such that we have that the following bound holds. So we have that the absolute values of f times g is less or equal than m times uh, the LP norm of f. And this must be true for any f uh, for all. 
bounded and measurable f. Okay, so, um, so I mean, somehow it makes sense to consider the LP norm of f because uh, we are saying that the function f must be, of course, measurable and bounded, and we are within um, a set of measure, of finite measures, so this norm is finite, okay? So they, in particular, they are in, in LP. Okay, then the conclusion is the following. Then, f if we know this, we can infer something about G. We know that G is uh, in LQ. Okay, with as usual, I, I mean with P and Q exp uh, conjugate exponent, right? Okay. And the IQ norm G can be bounded by M. So also in this case, we, we distinguish uh, two cases. So in the first one, when P is in between, uh, in, in the open interval one and plus infinity. Uh, P is in between. And then we will consider the case when P is equal to one. Define starting by G a sequence of measurable functions in a usual way, uh, measurable and uh, bounded function. Okay, well, so we define a sequence of uh, bounded function. call them GN, for instance. So in this way, so they are equal to G of X if uh, the modulus of G of X is less or equal than N, or otherwise you just put it, uh, you define it as uh, zero. So it's a, it's a cutoff somehow. Okay, and uh, so starting from this function gn, we define other auxiliary function. Fn, such that they are gn uh, to the power q over p. So this is a choice that we already made before, the sign of gn. Okay, so we have we compute the LP norm of this function of Fn, and this is okay by definition is just the LQ norm of the function Gn. Q over P and um, okay just let me observe that the modulus of G n to the power Q is equal to F n times G n which is equal to uh, F n times So what about this norm, the Q norm of Gn to the power Q? Okay, by definition it is 
over the integral over e of the modulus of gn to the power q. Then we use that fact, so we have this is e fn times g. And this is, now I use the hypothesis, this is by, yeah, this is by hypothesis. Oh, it's less or equal than m. Fn power p, which is equal to m times I use that equality. Okay. So now, since we have that they are conjugate exponents, so q minus qb is equal to 1. So we have, we have that OK, so let me write it in this way, which is that's what equal than M. So we have that okay, so this means uh, that this integral is less or equal than M to the power Q. And moreover we have that gn to the power q converged pointwise to g to the power q uh, almost everywhere in e. And so we are, uh, we are allowed to apply the Fatou's lemma. Okay, these are bounded. Once we have that G is in that Q, and its norm, it's, it's indeed bounded by this M. So this concludes the part uh, uh, concerning when P lies between 1 and infinity, OK? So for the other case, OK, for the case, when p is equal to 1, We argue in this way. Okay, so we, we somehow we we define this this set F, which is the set of the point in E, where uh, the modulus of G is larger than M plus some um, plus an epsilon. Okay, so. Okay, so g of x is larger than equal than m plus epsilon. So somehow, I mean, our goal would be would be to prove would be to prove that the measure of f is is zero. Okay, again, we perform a suitable choice of d 
this uh, kind of test function f. So let f be defined as the sine of g uh, times the characteristic function of uh, this set f. OK, so then we compute the what we are interested in, so the, the L1 norm of f, we use the definition, so this is the integral of the modulus of f over e, we use this. Uh, this will be uh, larger or equal than f times g. Okay, so basically we see that if the measure of f is positive, then we get a contradiction. Um, sorry, I did a sign of. Sorry, I did a mistake. Um, so. Sorry. Okay, this is the, the sine of G times Q of F. Uh, it is the measure of F. Okay. And then we have that M times the measure of F is equal to m times the L1 norm. Now we use the hypothesis which is actually equal than Now we get a contradiction. So we get that if uh, the measure of f is uh, indeed uh, strictly positive, so we can cancel out, and we would obtain that that m is larger than the measure of m plus epsilon, which of course is a, a contradiction. Okay, it's, it's, it's impossible. So it's a contradiction. And so we have that indeed uh, the measure of f is, uh, is zero. And so, and so we have that the L infinity norm of g is less or equal to, than m. So this concludes the proof. Okay, so mm, on the next time we will uh, can ant anticipate what we will we'll see. So it's the following theorem, and this will conclude somehow uh, these parts of the course. There is a representation theorem.
which tells you the following. So if you have f a bounded linear functional in a P, way to represent it in, uh, in the form that we use uh, during these lectures, then there is a unique function uh, g, which is in q, okay, where p and q are, are, are usual, are conjugate exponent. Uh, such that you can represent this function, and this is why the name is representation, in somehow in a quite uh, convenient form. You have that f of f is defined as f times g, and moreover, we have you can say something about the norm uh, of f as a linear function, and just that the norm of f as a functional is equal to the, to the LQ norm of, uh, of g, of this uh, somehow representation function, okay? So, but we will prove this uh, next time. I think that for today we can stop.